I uh, sure. am delighted to be here. I'm actually in Florida. I live in Ormond Beach, Florida, and I was the president of the Florida State Poets for four years. We hosted a national convention during that time, and uh, I'm currently the second vice president of the NFSPS, and my job is program development for new ideas and recruiting and bringing new things in, into NFSPS. <clears throat> and back in 2017, we had our first blackberry peach competition. And the blackberry peach is made up of three fairly famous people uh, who I think you guys know. Uh, we have uh, Phil Peach, Fillmore Peach is the peach. Eleanor Berry is the berry. And we have uh, Shirley Blackwell is black. So the Blackberry Peach, these are the people who got it started. Phil put up the original money. And, and so it was my job to implement the, the new program, which has to do with spoken word. And the idea of spoken word goes back to uh, before the written word, we had the spoken word. And spoken word used to be part of the Olympics. And so it's a tradition that we've had for a long time and, and it goes into drama and performance as well. And the idea was to bring that element into the NFSPS, which was and remains primarily a literary organization to bring in that part of it. And then thereby attracting new members, people who were not traditionally uh, associated with a program like NFSPS. And so we've been pretty successful. We've had five years now of the competition I went back and I looked at all of the people who had uh, been a part of it, and there was only one from Indiana, and it was only in the first year. So it's good I'm here to tell you about it and hopefully mm -hmm. stimulate your interest in the Blackberry Peach. So it's one of the major uh, competitions in NFSPS. It has a thousand dollar first prize, five hundred second, two fifty third, and <clears throat> you're also published in a book. Uh, and it's four, you pick your four best poems. They can be previously published. And then you submit them both in written form and in an audio file. It's no video is involved. It's just audio, your voice, and your poems. And they go to a national judge. And uh, the judge, the year, I think we're going to see 2019. Is that the one that we're going to see? Yes, the 2019 right. one in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the one in Santa Fe. So the one in Santa Fe was actually the woman, the winner that year uh, was from Florida, B.J. Allegood in 2019. So uh, we've had winners from all over the country, and we want Indiana to start participating and get some winners as well and champions. So let's look at the video, which will give you a good idea of how the program works. It begins... Next year for 2022, it will begin on January 1st until March 15th. And you use Submittable, which if you're new to it, you'll have to learn how to do it. It's not complicated to submit four audio files and of your four best poems and four written. So here are the winners from 2019 performing in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The video is going to roll. It's about 13... 33 minutes long. I'm honored to be the chair of the Blackberry Peach Program, and I thank you all for coming and being here. I especially want to thank my supportive family members, my wife Shirley, my daughter Michaela, my daughter Joy, who are here uh, with us. It warms my heart to have my family here. Um, the Blackberry Peach was started by three individuals who had a vision to bring spoken word into our primarily literary organization. Two of them are here with us today. It's the Blackberry Peach, and Shirley Blackwell is the black in Blackberry Peach, sitting in the front row. <laughs> Eleanor Berry, who was formerly the president of NF, NSPW, um, couldn't be here. She has pneumonia. She's in Oregon, unfortunately. But we have Fillmore Peach of the Blackberry Peach sitting here in the front row. Phil.
this is the third year of our competition, and the 2019 contest had 44 submissions that met all of the guidelines. From those submissions, we selected a first, second, and third place winners, and uh, honorable mentions as well. And so I urge all of you to consider entering the uh, 2020 competition. 2020 competition will be open from January 1st to February, I mean, March 15th of 2020. Pick out your four best poems. They can be previously published. That's not a, a, a problem in this particular competition. And it's all done through submittable. Uh, all the information is on the NF, uh, NSWP, uh, National Federation of State Poetry Society's website. We have had problems uh, with submittable in terms of the audio component. You have to submit four poems that are written, the same four poems presented uh, in uh, audio form. And so we're revising our guidelines in order to be able to uh, expedite that for next year, for 2020. So I urge all of you, please, uh, be a part of this. It's an important movement. We need to bring young people into our poetry family. And the oral tradition performance poetry is very big now with young people. And we're even considering sponsoring a national slam competition uh, in the future. And we're working on that right now. So uh, we're going to start with the uh, honorable mention of Paula J. Lambert. She comes to us from Columbus, Ohio. She owns Full Crescent Press, a small publisher of poetry books and broadsides So this is Celestial Navigation, Indigo Bunting, with an epigraph, a star by itself doesn't say anything. That's Richard Emlyn. First, indigo is illusion. For a bird brighter than a sapphire sky, Bunting is the color that calls to mind our catechism. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. What do we gain, I wonder, believing that bird is blue? And what have we gained, knowing that bird finds his way through the dark, following the same bright star that led wise men through the desert, to a woman big with God? It was a God who taught us that, or rather, a man jealous as all gods, who wanted only to know, who took away the sky and watched a bird he believed was blue falter, then brought the stars back and shouted hallelujah, as if the wise had not known all along. Chin up, keep steady. Make no mistake, this is not a story about faith. It's about what we ought to be able to intuit. We are made of Earth, and that is beauty enough. We know where we're headed. We can feast when we get there, knowing this. The same star guides us home. Next performer for honorable mention, Shana Oma. She lives in Madison Lake, Minnesota, with her husband and is the vice president of the Southern Minnesota Poetry Society. Welcome. Mankind's relationship with coffee began, it is said. 1,000 years ago in Ethiopia, when a goat herd watched his goats go mad after eating some red berries. From there, the discovery spread to the Middle East, where holy men tried to ban the popular drink, until both the Sultan and the Pope declared it holy. A thief launched South America's coffee industry by stealing a single slip from the court of Louis XIV and carrying it across the ocean. How do you take it? Black as the devil, hot as hell, pure as an angel, 
sweet as love. <coughs> Charles Talleyrand. How did such bliss come to graph or cup, to pot or demitasse? The hand thrills to the warmth within the grasp. The eye marks the oak pellucid dark, and tongue welcomes blessed bitterness. It comes to soothe the morning glare, companion of the later hours, the fragrant warmth. <laughs> Give thanks to cough a goat herd or no old shake whose goats, goats danced giddy by the bush, to the sultan and the pope who doubters dashing lest the beatific cup, to the thief who dared defraud a king whose fragile slip and empire soon began, to them we owe our morning draft, our cup of joe, our muddy water, to them we turn for our stay up late, our dark and strong, our picker upper, oh do not fear the barista's haughty eye. Coretto, Fredo, Lungo, Ristretto, harmless, skinny, dry, on a leash, however you take it, your dose of caffeine. Praise the giddy goats, the red berries, the green leaves. Our third place winner is Melissa Huff. She's both a poet and an artist. She creates her poetry from many sources, including the power and mystery of the natural world. Listen. Um, a few quick thank yous that I just must say. Um, first, to our three sponsors, to Shirley Blackwell and Eleanor Berry and Bill Beach, Heartfelt thanks for making this possible. Also, many thanks to Joe Cavanaugh for shepherding the details. And thanks to Seth for his time, his thoughtfulness, and expertise in judging. Thanks to all of you for coming. It is a delight to be with you. I want to say that for nearly 30 years, nearly every summer, I have spent time in the Rocky Mountains. Over the course of one of those summers, I found I needed to write this poem. Belonging. I am not a part of this landscape, not like those who drink from its valleys day after day, who sit with its mountains evening after evening. They know its moods, its appetites, its attitudes, the way it sometimes holds you to its breast, the way at other times it stands apart, aloof, accepting admiration from a distance. I am not a part of this landscape, not like those who know what makes the wildflowers waken, what level of light the hawks need for hunting and when the elk will agree to be seen. They can take its temperature, tell you where its water lives, and where it hides its fruits. They know the scent of its awakening, the color of its anger, and where its storms will go to die. I am not a part of this landscape, not like those who read the signs of sickness in its trees who know which creatures whisper to the night, and which ones dance with the sun. They hear the sound of leaves letting go, of snow caressing the river. They've learned the language of birds. Their feet follow paths that speak to the sky. Their eyes read the surface of streams. I am not a part of this landscape, not today. And yet, if I would live in these skies long enough, walk with these winds far enough, if I would sing to these forests often enough, perhaps this landscape would become a part of me, and I would be one of them. Our number two winner, Ray Menes from Orlando, Florida, who is a visual artist as well as a great poet and slam poet, couldn't be here with us.
today. So he sent us this video. The thing about being half dolphin, half shark is that aquariums love you. When I put you on display, point out your parts as if your parents were a car wreck. Twisted metal fragments folded together, parsing which pieces of you came from where, using the words dominant traits and recessive genes like their designer clothing. Meanwhile, zoologists try to resolve you, you a broken Rubik's Cube, because no scientist suffers an aberration, drawing categories like fish hooks to hang you on. The thing about being half dolphin, half shark is they don't know which tank to put you in. Sharks keep counting your teeth as though you will make sense once the numbers add up. Dolphins listen to your gills and wonder why is your nose so flat? They'll try to speak to you and clicks and whistles that only sound like clicks and whistles to you, they will secretly make fun of the size of your blowhole. Sharks will question, sharks will question if you even like chum or if that's too much blood for your mouth to handle. You have to prove your evolution with every bite. Try not to play so nicely with humans because it looks bad. The sharks though will think there's too much dolphin in you. The dolphins, they'll think there's too much shark in you. Can't get past the smoke in your eyes, how you chew too loudly. The thing about being half dolphin, half shark is you learn how to be alienated from both classes. How not to belong to anything because you were born not to belong to anything. You try to remember that your parents birthed you out of love, not permission. Try to remember that a label does not mean a natural, that labels are zoologist concerns, not yours. But the thing about being half dolphin, half shark is that humans only like you behind glass. You see, people can't handle contradictions. When they see fangs, they need walls to keep you in. List you as threatening, not satisfied unless you're performing. Willing to feed you so long as you stay blunted jaw and raised flipper, but still you become the nightmare they want to be rid of. Fins swimming down Main Street without asking permission. They start imagining their neighborhoods as steel cages submerged. You circling to make meals of them, they think they'd make good meals. Don't know they smell of spoiled catfish. Don't know you long for salt water, for ocean floors, fathoms for their incessant splashing. But the thing about being half dolphin, half shark is that people see what they want to, forget what they want to. We'll make you the main course if it feeds them. We'll make you the star attraction if it pleases them. But no matter how they tax you, you must remember you're not really half anything. You are whole everything. You are the stuff of legends, the myths they tell, because that's what humans do when they don't understand something. You become Kraken, Scylla, Charybdis. You become Bigfoot blurring out assumptions, become Phoenix rising from the ashes of their disbelief. You must remember that legacy is a wake you leave, and not the grumblings of bipeds who never ventured beyond the shallows of their own gene pool. Bipeds who scream and shout and march and burn, but never use their voices to echo locate the truth in the dark. But the most important thing about being half dolphin, half shark, is that you, you decide what that means. If you don't, someone will do it for you. Label you a freak, mistake, a traitor, or a fake. They will shove you in the smallest container they can find. Smile and wave as you thrash against the sides. Deny that your very inheritance is the ocean, that the sea runs through your veins. But it does. But it is. You are a colossus of roads standing between continents. You are a bridge in a world filled with walls. You are a miracle. You are enough. So don't ever let anyone tell you different. Mud caked and scabbed, 
his feet barefooted, nearly black. When the teenager in front of them finished his transaction, they moved forward. Get rid of that, she shrieked, wrenching the chocolate bar from his hands with claw-like nails. You think you deserve that, you little jerk. Why would anyone buy anything for you? You're nothing. Her maniacal laughter flew around the store, its talons puncturing the bread and crackers, swooping off the sports drinks and soda, and perched on the counter over his head. He looked up with six years of confusion and 80 years of despair an empty, cavernous soul. She'd set him up for the fall and the anticipation of the execution made it all the more gleeful. The most fun she'd had in 20 minutes. And I wonder, 17 years later, what prison he's in now. Okay, so now we're going to have an open reading of people who have uh, submitted and were not prize winners this year. Again, I urge all of you to consider submitting next year. But before we begin with that, we're going to ask Seth to come up and give us a poem of this. This is titled, Ode to Great Ghosts. Before, before he begins... I into a melancholy sky. My one this is, in gray, the sun. my idea would be if we could end here. This is a very long performance in the open reading part. I think there are going to be another sixteen poets, and that's probably too long. I think it is, and I think what we ought to do is call it good there at that point, and talk a little bit about unfortunately the fact that we were in the New Mexico State Rotunda of the legislative building, which is a beautiful building, but the acoustics were tough to capture. And the mics, we weren't mic'd that well. You could see the difference between Ray Jimenez in Florida and what you could hear from him and what we could hear from the rest of us, and also the jerky movements on, on YouTube. But uh, check it out directly on YouTube. And my advice would be to go to the 2021 winners, this year's winners. You just type in 2021 Blackberry Peach contest winners on YouTube and it will come up for you. And you'll see a little more contemporary version of it. And we've gotten much, much better on the video component of it. And uh, although the BJ Alligan's poem at the end was just one of the most powerful emotional uh, moments, and yet by video, it was hard to really capture that. And so I want to thank everyone for being involved and listening to me so far. And, and before I throw it open to questions, I want to stress that this is open to anyone. And it's not uh, hard to do, but it may seem like something that's very difficult. But particularly for the Blackberry Peach, you don't have to, you're not on video. It's just your voice. And you can record and re-record as much as you want until you get it perfectly, exactly the way you want it. And the only limitation is that it's limited to three minutes. So, and again, January 1st, it, it will be opened again. We really encourage you to be a part of the Blackberry Peach Poetry Spoken Word Competition next year. And I had mentioned at the beginning that we were thinking about having a national slam competition. And so I'm gonna spend the rest of my time just talking a little bit about that. Uh, a slam competition is different than the normal Blackberry Peach. It will be completely separate and distinct, but a part of the overall program. And it will be a, by invitation. We're trying to get the best uh, performance art poets, the best spoken word poets in the country to come to Florida next October, October 20th to the 23rd, it's going to be. 
It's going to be in a wonderful place, Daytona Beach Shores, which is one of the nicest beaches in Florida. Uh, in October, it's ideal here. And for your friends and family, it would be a great outing to come to the event. It's going to be held in concert with the Florida State Poets Association annual convention as well. So there's a, a wonderful opportunity to come to Florida. The particular hotel we picked out uh, is in Daytona Beach Shores, which is the nicest beach in this area. And it's right on the beach. It has uh, free food, uh, Wi-Fi, free uh, hot breakfast, uh, a wonderful pool and spa with no resort fees. It's $139 for a, a suite that that's, uh, sleeps four people. So it's a real good buy and a good opportunity. If you ever wanted to come to Florida and stay in a nice place and have a good time, this is the, this is the opportunity at a, at, a, at a bargain, really a bargain price. So that competition is going to be open to 48 of the best poets in the country. And what we hope each uh, state will do will be to choose a champion for the state and have a competition in the spring. Each state would have a competition of their own, coincident with whatever spring meeting they're going to have. We used to have in Florida, we called it the spring fling. Uh, a competition to determine uh, your champion and then uh, hopefully sponsor that champion to come to Florida uh, to participate in the national championship. And we're trying to put together, and I think we will successfully, uh, a documentary film that will be high quality that we're going to try and get on PBS. And, you know, it's an Olympic year and we're kind of talking about it being the spoken word Olympic event of the year. And it will be for, to crown a national champion and having each state, for example, Indiana, uh, in the spring, I hope, would uh, put together some way of choosing a champion. And what we're doing now, we're in the process of doing, we have a working group of 12 people. Uh, you know, many of them, Susan Chambers and Eleanor Berry and Bill Peach and myself and a number of people from Florida where it's being held. We're putting together guidelines for each state, for a state to select their champion, uh, how we would like to have it done. So it would be consistent with the way that we're doing to the selection process for the final. So um, those will be forthcoming soon and they'll be sent out to each state. And we hope a majority of our 33 states will send a champion to the event and uh, represent their state. And so that's our idea. It's the first time it's never been done before. And it's something that I think is going to be really very exciting. And um, I think it will be good for our organization to, to get involved in some of the excitement. You can see the energy that uh, went into uh, the performance when the guy was talking about half shark, half dolphin. I mean, that's the kind of excitement that you get when you're there. And the same thing with uh, you can see with B.J. Alligood, there's a lot of um, excitement generated, and I think that's good. I think we all want that and want that, too. So with that, I, I think I've said everything I need to say or want to say, and now I want to answer some questions, if anyone has some for me, about either the regular Blackberry Peach that goes from January to March 15th, where you submit the four poems, or... Uh, the selection of uh, a representative from your state to attend next year in October here in Florida, the competition, the slam competition. Are there any questions? Um, Joe, I have one. Um, Please. If, if we have some people who are new to that particular form of genre, mm -hmm. um, is there any way that you could maybe get us started or uh, some way that we can or some sites that you would recommend. I know that there are, I know that the handful of folks at the national level who are really into this, and I try to stay connected with them, but I mean, for some people who are beginning or some people who just have to get over that shyness to sure, get it out course, there, I mean, how, how can you get us started? Okay, well, what we did in Florida, where we have a very active SLAM community already existing, within our own organization, there were very few people even knew what a slam was. I saw my first one at the uh, national convention that was in uh, New Mexico. Uh, 
and in Albuquerque. I was very moved by it, and that's generated my interest in in keeping it going. So, yeah, I'm I'm available to do that. I'll help any way I can. I probably would say if you get a small committee uh, together, uh, then we could work with you know the people in that committee to uh, talk about how to structure the event. Now, when we first did it in the Florida State Boats Association, all we did was take the evening hours between, I think it was like 7.30 to 8.30. And then we just asked people, and they knew they were going to be asked, but we asked people who wants to participate. And it was only one poem, you know, one poem. They didn't have to memorize it. They could read it. We went through the usual slam format. That is, you select from the audience five judges. And then uh, you have a timekeeper. No one can go over three minutes if they do their deducted by the time that they go over. And the rules are very simple. So then people would just stand up and they would take their best poem and they'd get up to the mic and they could read it or if they'd memorized it, you know, they could do have a little more performance aspect to it, but they could uh, perform in front of the five judges. The five judges then score each poem as it's uh, presented. Uh, and on one to 10 basis, uh, even using decimal points, 9.4, 8.6, whatever, like the Olympics kind of. And then uh, they take those five, uh, each judge's score, they throw out the top one, the, the best one, and then the lowest one, and they use the middle three, and then they mathematically come up with an average. So everyone who participates in a first round then gets a, a, a number. 8.6, which is an average of the, the three middle numbers, or 4.5, or whatever it is. So then you take you take the top five people, and then they do a second round, and then you go through it the same way. They get a numerical score from the five judges, and then there's always a championship round, the, the final round. And the interesting thing is that there's a cash prize. We gave a hundred dollars, you know, cash on the spot. And that doesn't usually happen with most of the stuff that we do. And so it added a little bit of excitement to it. And we found that our members loved it. People who had never had exposed to it just wanted to get up there and compete. I think it's part of their, our American heritage or whatever. We're competitive people at a certain level. And so it was a spontaneous uh, endeavor to do that. And so that's how we got it started. And you could do something as simple as that. Or you could do something a little more elaborate. And there are, the guidelines that we're going to send out will be pretty specific about what we would like to see. And I've summarized it there. You know, you have five judges. You, you do a numerical score. You try and make it uh, very, um, not scientifically, but at least there's a basis. It's not just the opinion. One person's opinion, this guy's better than that woman. Or this woman's better than, you know, it isn't like that. It's more... A consensus of the judges' uh, scores. And the competition element to it, it adds some zest uh, and a little bit of excitement to it. And, you know, the cash prizes are good. I think we gave $100, 50 and 25 bucks. And I think we could afford it, you know. Joe, Joe, so could I ask you a couple yes, questions? Please. Um, yeah. You said that, you know, because it's in rounds like that. So in when they move into the next round, if they get enough points, I mm -hmm. actually have two questions. This is one. Mm -hmm. um, do, do they do the same poem again, or is it a different? No, okay. no, different, different. So poem. different poems each time different they poem. advance. Right, and okay. also it has to be an original poem. It has to be well, their yeah. poem. Sure. Yeah. Figured that. Right. And then my my more general question, and forgive my ignorance, but this mm -hmm. is uh, a, a genre of poetry that I have not explored very much since, mm -hmm. uh, well, at least for several decades. Um, I hear a lot of spoken word, mm -hmm. slam, and different words about uh, presentation poetry. Do they all mean the same thing, or is spoken word, is there some significant difference between slam, spoken word, presentation? Is there anything yes. we need to know on that kind of, uh, like, definitions, I guess, <laughs> if you will? Yeah, yeah. Well, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is a slam is totally different than spoken word. Spoken word is usually a presentation. You know, here's Joe Cavanaugh. He's going to, he's going to read a poem and, and that's it. But in a slam, I'm competing with everybody else who's reading for a prize or a specific prize. 
and it has to be live. And you don't have to memorize. You know, you can read. A lot of people are using their phones now. Some people can memorize, but they're afraid they're going to forget. And so then they're able to uh, have a prompt there if they need it. So the, the slam is a competition that's kind of spontaneous and happening live, whereas uh, spoken poetry usually is um, mixed with storytelling, uh, a narrative aspect to it. It's got many types that are uh, different in some ways. You know, it's not so much structured poetry, though, like the Villanelle or what you were talking about with the Japanese forms. It's usually much more free form in its essence. And it usually tells a story and has an ending and has a point usually. But the slam is, is something really different. So we've had this other competition where you just pick your four best poems, you read them, you know, you record them, which is easy with your phone now, very easy, or your computer and a written form. And then you send them both in and then a judge looks, looks at all of them. You know, we have, that year we had 44, I read them all, I forward them to the judge, the judge reads them all, and then listens to them all, and then comes up with a winner like any other national competition. But next year in October, this is going to be different. This is going to be actually the first time NFSPS has really had a slam competition where we're going to make a national champion and crown a national champion, so to speak. Thank so you. I have another that, question, that helps. That, thank you. Um, when you said that the judges come up with their scoring, what would be some of the elements that they consider? Do they consider uh, the, the, the dramatics? Do they consider the actual poem itself? Do they consider the, the tone, the acting? What, what all things are they considering when they come up with these points? Yeah, well, you know, the thing about it is it's part of the spontaneity of picking the judges from the audience. When I first got involved in it, in order to generate the prize money, I asked people to become sponsors and promised them that they would be judges, which was my naivete. So the first night we went there and I told the, the people who were the slam uh, competitors that we were going to do this, they said, absolutely not. You have to pick five people from the audience. You can't have pre-selected judges. And eventually I had to back down and that's exactly what we did. But the idea there is that each judge has their own perception and their own values and their own criteria that they're going to judge by. And so all of the things that you mentioned are definitely going to come in, uh, come into it. And some of us who are more attuned to more traditional poetry will be looking for what we think is good that way and people who are maybe more interested in drama and uh, storytelling may like that part of it. But in the end, it's got to be, it's got to have some punch. It's got to have, it's got to go somewhere. It's got to have some special meaning. It's got to, like BJ's poem was the most, you know, heart-wrenching possible poem, and that's why she won. She's not generally like that in her poetry, but that particular poem really moved people. This six-year-old boy who wanted a chocolate bar whose mother was crazy and, and you know, caused him in the end to be in a penitentiary. So uh, it's a very, very sad, emotional type of poem. And so it has, it has some uh, gravity to it, let's say, or it has some substance to it. It has something that will appeal to the judges because let's face it. I mean, Americans today are very, number one, uh, more and more going toward video more and more going to some short things that have an impact. And so that's the taste, I think, in the general populace. And I think that kind of slam is that going toward in that direction, rather than the kind of solitary poet writing poems about nature and things like that. This is a more contemporary, and it's kind of like an urban form. You know, it's more, it's more in that idea of movement and, uh, interaction with people. So I can't answer your question directly, but I can say that <laughs> all those things would go, in, would go into it according to <laughs> what the judges are looking for. And Dennis? And I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to say that some of the people that we have a working group of 12 people that are working on putting this together now. And if, if someone wants to join from your state, we'd, we'd welcome you. Uh, the idea is to get 
uh, regions, like a Northeast region, and you guys would be in a kind of central region. And Susan Chambers, who many of you know, I think, is from Minnesota, would be like, a, we think, a regional coordinator who would help you put together your state competition. She, incidentally, has won twice, Susan Chambers. She's a brilliant poet. And uh, so she would be available in, in the area region, kind of in the Midwest, to work with you to, to put together something. I would also help any way I could to, to do it. And really, it, it isn't that hard, particularly when we get these written guidelines out. I think if you, you read them through, you know, I, I think it'd be, you're well capable of doing that. The structure of your convention today is more complex than what we're talking about. Just you haven't done it before. I saw there was another hand, at least one more hand. Yeah, Dennis? Uh, yes, Joe. Uh, does that mean you're moving away from the original format entirely of the original uh, uh, contest? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. The original contest will, con will continue for the next 20 years. It's been well endowed by Phil Peach. He's put the money up. He's, he's guaranteed 15 years of financing the, the regular Blackberry Peach, but he's also very interested in the slam. And so he's also putting the money up this year, or at least part of it. We're gonna have a sponsor program as well uh, for the slam this year. In 1962, he was in Dublin, Ireland, and he went to a slam and he came in second and ever since then, he's been hooked, you know, and <laughs> if you know Phil Peach, he's, he's gray like we are. He's been, he's been around, but he had that experience very young and he was bitten by that. And so he's very much in favor of the slam. So we hope the slam will be an annual competition. Uh, the prizes are big, $2,000 to the winner. And, and the final 12 people will all win prizes, substantial uh, monetary prizes, and so that's what attracts these uh, people who are competing all over the country in these slams. So it would be, it's going to be by invitation so that each state will have a champion that will be invited. All of the Blackberry Peach winners over the last five years will be invited. And then people who are, have won slams that aren't sponsored by us, but are acknowledged slams will be invited. And so we hope to get the 48 best people to compete in the slam. But I, that's something a little different than the regular, as you point out, is the regular contest. The regular contest, everybody should get into that. You know, if, if you're really good at this or you've, you've won the Blackberry Peach, let's say you're good at, you're qualified to enter into the, to the slam competition. Now, I'm glad to hear that, Joe. Uh, it, it's good to have a, a contest of champions, but it's also good to have uh, a regular poets that compete and express themselves. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to both formats. Great. Great. Good. Thank you. Great. Well, did I see a question at the bottom saying, what is uh, a, a non-NFSBS slam? Mm -hmm. We're being very loose with that definition. Anybody who wins one, and if we get to the point, so there are 35 members now of NFSBS. If we got everybody, that would be 35. There have been about 22 winners of Blackberry Peach. So we think we can get 48 easily enough. But if we can't, then we're going to look to people submitting videos if necessary. You know, if we have one or two places left and five or 10 people who want to do it, and then we would have some judges determine which of those people should compete. So it's a little like the Olympics. I mean, each state, you know, will send someone and compete on a, a basis where the judges are, uh, have a format that they use that make it fair. Thank you. Well, thank you, Florida, Joseph, you guys, for, spending time. Time, for spending time with us Hoosiers. And we've got some Wolverines in the, in the audience as well. All right. So All right. thank you All for right. your guidance. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that our paths will cross and cross and cross. Good. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, who's you? <laughs> thank you so much, Joseph. Okay. Thank you.